Last week, we introduced theropods in a fairly general way. They are the most diverse suborder of dinosaurs, and the only one with extant members, so it merits spending another week going through them in more detail. Early in theropod evolution, the feet were stabilized and lengthened, reducing the outer toes and supporting all the weight of the body on three toes of each foot. Also during this early phase, the furcula was developed, a small boomerang-shaped bone that ties the two sides of the shoulder girdle together. These characteristics separate the slightly more advanced neotheropods from their less differentiated ancestors, like Herrerasaurus. The furcula was associated with birds and not really well known in dinosaurs initially, but now we know that most theropod dinosaurs had furculae. Pneumaticity of skeletons also advanced further in theropods than it did in other suborders of dinosaurs. Pleuraceals, or air pockets in bones, occur in the skeletons of all saurischian dinosaurs, theropods, and sauropodomorphs alike. As theropods advance, though, the degree of pneumatic invasion advanced in complexity, and the volume of bone being replaced by air. This system of air pockets was integrated with the lungs and pulmonary system, resulting in a unidirectional airflow and gas exchange apparatus unrivaled in efficiency. Fresh air was constantly streaming through the lungs of dinosaurs as it does through the lungs of birds today. Even modern crocodilians have a similar gas exchange system, suggesting that all archosaurs possessed unidirectional breathing. With sufficient advances in lightning and stabilizing the skeleton in place, the stage was set for theropods to advance and diversify, as well as grow some really large forms. By the late Jurassic, large carnosaurs like Allosaurus and Megalosaurus were approaching lengths of 10 meters, or well over 30 feet. In addition to large carnosaurian theropods, the late Jurassic also saw the rise of smaller Salurosaurs. It is perhaps counterintuitive, but within the Salurosaurs, the Tyrannosaurids evolved. When they first appear in the fossil record, Tyrannosaurids are relatively small, as was typical for Salurosaurs. By the middle of the Cretaceous, though, we see carnosaurs disappear in North America and Asia, and the large predator niche begins being filled by tyrannosauroids. They continue to grow larger through the end of the Cretaceous, culminating in Tyrannosaurus. During the early Cretaceous, ecosystems are shifting with the explosion of flowering plants. Theropods also begin to take advantage of this new source of nutrition, evolving herbivorous forms to compete with the other suborders of dinosaurs, instead of just eating them. In Laurasia, we have the bird mimic saurians, or the ornithomimosaurs. These dinosaurs look very much like ostriches and emus, but with tails and long arms. They probably lived very similarly to these ratite birds as well with similarly herbivorous to omnivorous diets. Ornithomimosaurs are the only herbivorous group of theropods that are not members of the Maniraptora, which is a slightly more exclusive group of theropods denoted by the presence of a semilunate wrist bone, or carpal. Also limited to Laurasia in their distribution, like ornithomimosaurs, was a radiation of herbivorous dinosaurs that were very sloth-like in appearance due to their long arms and enormous hand claws, the Therizinosaurs, and another group also with long arms, but with crests running from their rostrum to the top of their heads called Ovaraptorids. You may have heard the story of how Ovaraptor got a name meaning egg thief. You might recall the expedition led by Roy Chapman Andrews that found the first dinosaur nests. The abundance of nests and another dinosaur, Protoceratops, made it seem to the expedition that the abundant nests and dinosaurs went together, meaning all of the nests they were seeing must have protoceratops eggs in them. They therefore assumed that the oviraptor fossils they were finding in close proximity to some nests belonged to a dinosaur that specialized in stealing and eating the eggs of these other dinosaurs. Oviraptorids may or may not have eaten eggs, since it takes no special dentition to do so, Oviraptorids are toothless dinosaurs, with short, broad, probably powerful beaks. 
plant material of some sort seems to be their most likely diet, but they seem equipped to eat small prey and possibly shelled invertebrates as well. The most widely distributed, yet probably most rare group of herbivorous theropods is the Alvarez sorids. They have been found in Europe, Asia, and North America, which would make sense for a Laurasian group of dinosaurs. However, they also appear in South America, in the Middle Cretaceous, somehow having succeeded in a transcontinental transplantation around then. In addition to their biogeographical strangeness, They also have peculiarly short arms that end in a single, robustly clawed finger, and seem to have remained relatively small for dinosaurs, with the largest species only growing to a few feet in length. All of these herbivorous theropods we've been discussing probably had their bodies coated in a combination of primitive downy feathers and more advanced pinaceous feathers, giving them a bird-like appearance. The next group of theropods we will discuss, the paraves, adds very wing-like appendages to their morphology, taking their bird-like appearances to the next level. This clade includes birds, and the most derived group of theropods, the dinonychosaurs, which includes everything you've envisioned as a raptor, like velociraptor and deinonychus, as well as troodonids. These theropods are distinguished by their retroverted pubes, meaning the hip bones that usually point down and forward point more backward, more closely paralleling the ischia, as we see in modern bird hips. Dinonychosaurs also have the famous retractable claw on the second toe of each foot, which would have given them a lethal death grip with their feet and allowed them to climb vertical surfaces just grasping with their feet including the flanks of larger prey animals. Some paravians, like the Deinonychosaur Microraptor and the Troodonid Anchiornis, even had long, stiff flight feathers on their legs. I can only imagine how dangerous early Cretaceous forests might have been with branches full of pack-hunting, four-winged theropods waiting to ambush and slice to pieces anything that walked beneath. The next theropod node, on the way toward birds, includes all of the things that have probably been described colloquially as fossil birds rather than fossil dinosaurs. The aviali have been defined as including archaeopteryx, sparrows, and everything in between. It seems interesting that the first known fossil bird, archaeopteryx, represented initially by a single isolated feather more than 150 years later still represents the evolutionary threshold between what we consider to be advanced enough to be more bird than dinosaur. This one fossil species, represented by a dozen or so individual specimens, has been probably more closely scrutinized over the past century and a half than any other. This is probably because for so long it has seemed to represent the link between birds and their reptilian ancestors. Initially, it seemed obvious to proponents of evolutionary theory, which was proposed around the same time that Archaeopteryx was discovered, in just a couple of decades after the word dinosaur was coined, that Archaeopteryx was something between modern birds and dinosaurs. There were some technical details that made this link difficult to be certain of, though. Paleontologists knew that modern birds were warm-blooded, but incorrectly assumed that dinosaurs, as large reptiles, were not. It was also incorrectly assumed that dinosaurs did not have feathers, as such evidence was not conclusively discovered until the 1990s, and seemed to be unlikely given the trace fossil evidence in the form of skin impressions that did not appear to preserve feathers. Modern birds also lack fingers or claws, save for one primitive bird known as the Hawatsin, which hatches with a couple of hand claws used for climbing, but sheds its claws as it matures. Tracking the evolution of the theropod hand seems to show that they lost digits 4 and 5 to arrive at their three-fingered hands, because their semi-opposable thumb suggested that they never lost digit 1, It turns out that theropods did reduce and lose digit 1 on the hand after all, and that digit 2 took on the appearance and functionality of digit 1 thanks to a frame shift in their developmental identities. The potential to become a thumb-like digit probably lies within any of the digits in the hand, 
but the potential is only unlocked if the digit grows in the position the thumb-like appendage would occupy. This is why it looks like theropods never lost their thumbs, because the next finger in immediately took on the appearance and functionality of a thumb when the digit previously filling that position was lost. Another issue seemed to be the origin of flight itself. It was thought that dinosaurs lived exclusively on the ground and that evolving wings from a ground-based animal was difficult to imagine. Running, hopping, and flapping would seem to be the steps needed to achieve flight, and it would appear to be a fruitless dance of ineptitude for the first dinosaurs trying to do this. It was proposed that maybe such a behavior was used to stir up small prey and corral them with feathered arms so that they could more easily be snatched with the mouth. Such ideas went along with what is referred to as the cursorial hypothesis for the origin of avian flight. Cursorial is a technical term for running, or being built for running, and the cursorial hypothesis is sometimes called the ground-up model for the origin of avian flight. Competing with this hypothesis is the trees-down model, or the arboreal hypothesis for the origin of avian flight. Proponents of the idea that birds originated from a clade other than dinosaurs tended to think the arboreal hypothesis was superior. Gliding from an already elevated starting point seemed a more obvious stage on the progression toward powered, flapping flight, and it seems that something other than a dinosaur would have been the arboreal ancestral stock in which this ability would have developed. The ability to flap their wings would have evolved from the ability to control their glide path and descent. One thing that had not been thought of was running up trees in order to get to those branches high enough to where gliding would be possible. The diversity of tiny theropods in the Cretaceous was also previously unimagined, yet now fossil discoveries have been piling up since the turn of the millennium from fine-grained shales that sometimes preserve in exquisite detail soft tissues. Soft tissues including plumage articulated to these small, advanced theropod dinosaurs, including a number of Mesozoic bird clades. Many of the derived features of Mesozoic birds are flight-related. One of the first things they did that made flight easier to achieve and simultaneously made them look much more like birds and less like dinosaurs was to ditch the tail. Primitively useful as a rudder, tails soon became more of a drag, literally in the aerodynamic sense, as well as an unnecessary weight. Once the wings of the arms were sufficiently adapted to control flight without the long, heavy tail. With the tail bones reduced to the stubby vestigial remnants of a tail called a pygostyle, tail feathers could anchor more robustly and provide all the stabilization needed in a lighter, more flight-capable animal. Two major branches of birds sported this shortened tail. The Ornithuromorpha, which translates to bird tail shape, and a group known as the opposite birds, or Enantiornithes. Modern birds evolved from the former, while the latter, Enantiornithes, were an evolutionary dead end. Though they all went extinct when dinosaurs did at the end of the Cretaceous, it was enantiornithine birds that dominated the diversity of Mesozoic birds. These birds seemed to have evolved sufficient flight capabilities, but did not really press the envelope when it came to making sacrifices to make flight more efficient. They retained belly ribs or gastralia. They maintained flexibility in their axial skeletons rather than further reducing the number of vertebrae in their backs like modern birds did. Many of the things that happened in the ancestry of modern birds to further reduce weight and make the skeleton more rigid to maximize flight efficiency simply did not happen at any point in enantiornithine evolution. In the Mesozoic, ornithurin birds seem to have kept to the seasides. This was perhaps one environment in which they realized an advantage in their reliable and efficient flight mechanics. There are not many places to stop and rest when flying over oceans. There are also not many trees to climb and take off from, so being able to launch from ground level 
and maintain flight without overusing energy made seaside regions more favorable to ornithorid birds. In North America, we have some of the best examples of Mesozoic ornithorin birds. Hesperornis and Ichthyornis were both initially discovered in the chalk beds of western Kansas by O.C. Marsh's field crews. It was Ichthyornis that alerted the world to the fact that birds used to have teeth, since teeth had not yet been discovered and attributed to Archaeopteryx yet. We even have fossils from the late Cretaceous representing modern bird orders, and these are also orders that are specialized for living near water. This includes Anseriformes, Gaviformes, Shadraformes, Procellariformes, which in colloquial terms are things like ducks, loons, pipers, gulls, and petrels. Living in marine and aquatic environments seems to have favored modern birds and to have promoted surviving the Cretaceous extinction event. 